This is episode 132 of the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast, How Nursing Homes Can Prevent Falls. The Nursing Home Abuse Podcast is dedicated to providing news and information for families whose loved ones have been injured in a nursing home. Here are your hosts, Georgia Attorneys Rob Schenk and Will Smith. All right, welcome back. My name is Rob Schenk. And I'm Will Smith. And... If you listen to the previous podcast, which also dealt with prevention of falls in nursing homes, mm-hmm. you would have learned that Sunday, the 22nd, the Sunday before last, yeah. was Fall Prevention Awareness Day. Yes. Um, and not autumn prevention, right. as right. in we're trying to prevent autumn from coming. We're we going to stay it, summer we, forever. We bring that up because the day after Fall Prevention Awareness is the beginning of autumn. fall. Fall slash yeah. autumn. What is your more go-to uh, description of the season? Is it fall or autumn? Well, I've never said autumn. It's it's it, ever. It's been autumn. What did I say? Autumn. Autumn. Oh, I I, I really stress the T. The yeah. autumn. Yeah. Uh, I've always said fall. Yeah, autumn. I always say fall too. I think autumn is more like bourgeois. Yeah, it's, it's bougie. It's very bougie, or or just old fashioned. Old fashioned. Or maybe. It's a northern thing. Or none of those things, and we're the ones. Yeah, I have no idea. On the program today to, to talk about prevention of falls in the long-term care setting is Dr. Mindy Renfro. Will, what can you tell us about Dr. Mindy Renfro? Uh, Dr. Renfro is a geriatric physical therapist and associate professor who teaches in the School of Physical Therapy at uh, Turo University, Nevada, in research and geriatrics. Uh, she was selected by the CDC... Uh, as a fall prevention expert in 2009 and works closely with the National Council on Aging, American Physical Therapy Association, geriatric education centers, and many other organizations. She has studied and published in fall risk measures and validation of evidence-based fall prevention programs for subpopulations. She is a longtime advocate and educator of fall prevention and home modification for interprofessional clinicians and aging service providers, as well as older adults and their caregivers to ensure safe and successful aging in place. She enjoys being outdoors with her children, grandchildren, and she is the primary long-distance caregiver for her healthy aging parents. Healthy who are aged 90 and 93. That is amazing. Hey, congratulations. Anyway, Dr. Renfro, uh, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Fantastic. So um, the past couple of episodes, um, we've been talking about the prevention of falls in nursing homes because, as we stated in last episode, um, it comprises um, a lot of our of our caseload, um, injuries from falls, preventable falls. Um, and we, we talked, um, to the audience about September 22nd, which was last, the Sunday before last was fall prevention awareness day. And in light of that, we wanted to have the, you know, this episode and the previous episode dedicated to fall prevention. And we thought, you know, have guests on that are experts in this field and your name popped up. And that's why we are so happy that, um, that you were able to, to make it on the show. Um, and I guess we we'll start off with, um, wh- like, in your experience, in your in your education, and and your understanding, uh, wh- why why do you think that seniors, um, particularly seniors in in long term care settings, why are they so vulnerable to falls to begin with? Well, you know, every single person has their own set of fall risk factors, and. The fact that it's so variable makes it very tough to prevent. So at home, you have the factors of your body, your intrinsic factors, things that are typical for you, your activity level, your strength, your overall fitness, etc., and also your environment, how things are set up at home, how cluttered a house is, how if you have stairs, if the stairs are lit, etc., But you move into an institution and you add more layers. You add a much bigger environment that is new to you and probably has longer distances. It's unfamiliar. And then you have staff with their own risk factors. And then you have policies and procedures. So there's so many layers of fall risk factors that it the stakes go up and up and up. 
that makes perfect sense. Um, and it seems to me that uh, every category of risk that somebody falls into um, presents its own um, set of, I guess, interventions that can be set in place to prevent that particular person from falling. And one of those categories that we've we've talked about over and over again on this ep- on this podcast are um, seniors in long-term care facilities that have um, vision impairments, whether the vision impairments yeah. are from some type of disease or disorder or from maybe from medication. But what are some of the ways that nursing home staff can help prevent falls in that subset population of nursing home residents with, with vision impairments? Well, you know, as a physical therapist and a geriatric physical therapist, I spent about 12 years full-time in nursing homes. And one of my greatest frustrations, and saw it so many times, uh, the fr- frustration for other staff members, is loss of eyeglasses. Uh, They're put in the drawer so that they don't fall on the floor. And the next staff member comes in and doesn't see glasses, doesn't put them on, doesn't look for them. And some facilities mix up what is privacy and what is not. There are many ways to let staff know and visually as they walk into a room who needs glasses, who needs hearing Mm -hmm. aids, who needs an assistive device without interfering with a person's privacy, Mm -hmm. especially if you get their permission to mark it. So uh, there can be visual reminders. It can be how the the assistive devices or the glasses or the contact lenses for cataract patients, where they are, If they're ready to be used, they're clean, they're safe, they're adjusted, Mm -hmm. they're correct. And which ones to use? You know, as we get older, we should not be wearing multifocal lenses. We should have single vision lenses. Well, what that means is you probably have two pair of glasses. You probably have one for distance and one for reading. Mm And if unwittingly someone puts on the reading glasses to walk somebody, they're at a great disadvantage, high risk of falling, and vice versa. So it's very important that the glass people know there's glasses, they know where they are, and they're in the same place for every patient. And it is marked clearly when they are needed. In addition to that, because Medicare and its wonderful wisdom does not pay for glasses and does not pay for all vision exams in all areas, we have our patients without going to eye doctors at the point in their life where their eyes are changing the most rapidly. And that's a huge risk. Very few patients, and I forget the study, but in about 2015, they found only 20% of patients in nursing homes had their eyes examined once a year as recommended. So you've got to know what your eye health is. You have to address it and pay for whatever it is is needed and provide it. And sometimes... It needs to be done by the nursing home. If the family cannot pay for eyeglasses, that can be pursued by the family and the caregiver as needed equipment for safety and mobility. Uh, You know, something interesting that you brought up, because we've been we've been going through um, the several different podcasts dealing with fall preventions. It's such a big deal. Uh, But I like that you brought this up because. This is the first time we've mentioned it, but um, something as simple as people losing their eyeglasses is 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 a contri- uh, co- contributes to falls, and it's um, and you know this uh, from working in nursing homes, and and I worked in one for a long time. That is something that is very prevalent, which is people losing eyeglasses. It is not. It is not first and foremost on the the CNA's minds or or the staff's minds even though it should. And um, that's just an interesting 
a phenomenon that really contributes to falls as well. And I got to say that I, for the first time in my life, I am starting to understand how important it is that um, how multifocal glasses versus two separate types of glasses. I'm starting to now where um, I need bifocals. So oh, cool. when I have my normal glasses on and, you know, my wife will, you know, try to get in them and in, 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 very close to my face and whisper something to me. And I have to push her back because I can't see her face. And that's oh, cool. the never, never had that happen before. Where right. I, I can't, I can't see her. And she doesn't understand that. Like, well, you got your glasses on. It's like, well, that's not, the glasses yeah, are yeah. to see you far away. So that what you said is, is so super important that, you know, you got to have the right glasses on or you might as well not even have the glasses on yeah. at all. Yeah. Or they're a disadvantage. Yeah, exactly. You're hindering them. Um, so we've, we've talked a little bit about um, preventing falls um, for residents that have visual impairments. Um, there is another, uh, I feel like, a major risk factor for falls um, are those residents that have a tendency to, to wander. So um, can you kind of walk us through um, wh what are some of the, the factors, some, what are some of the action items and interventions that nursing homes can, can um, put in place to prevent falls or prevent wandering itself, but prevent falls in those residents who have a tendency to wander? Sure. And that, of course, varies with time of day and medication. And so what you do about it has to vary with the time of day and medication. Um, the end point of preventing wandering is a locked unit. Mm -hmm. And you certainly don't want to be there if you don't have to be. Yeah. So there's a lot of intervention in between. And it's interesting that many people um, from children with autism to older adults with cognitive um, decline or people having an anxiety or panic attack can be stopped from leaving an area or a room by a simple picture on the wall or door. Just a visual cue, stop. Mm -hmm. um, Something as simple as the picture of a stop sign on the inside of the door or hanging on the, you know, side of the door frame at eye level in a bright color can stop a lot of people. Yeah. One, one problem in nursing homes is auditory fall alarms. And if you have a loud noise go off, what do we learn all of our lives? You know, the smoke detector goes off, and what do we do? We leave, right? right? It's for safety. It's to get out of there. And then we go into the nursing home. We're medicated. We're maybe a bit confused. We're in a new mm -hmm. environment. And an alarm goes off. What are we going to want to do? Yeah. Get out of there. So to have a, an alarm go off to alert staff that you're standing and you may fall may cause the fall. And, and I just don't think that uh, it seems like when you walk into a nursing home, it, there's so many alarms going off that people become numb to it. And I just don't feel like the staff really respond to it. Right. But the other residents do. Oh, the other and residents that, do. That, yeah, you're right. And that can stop, that can cause someone to leave their room. Yeah. Another thing about um, alarms that work for people who tend to elope but don't go far because of mobility is wearing, putting an alarm on their wrist, not their neck, mm -hmm. that when they get up and they take a couple of steps, it sets off a blinking light in the hallway to the staff that someone's getting ready to leave. Um, there's no auditory. It doesn't flash in anybody's eyes. It doesn't awake anybody, but it will let people know quickly there's a problem and it's here. Oh, okay. Um, and it's a much better response um, alarm than an auditory alarm that could get three or four people up out of their bed right. and leaving. Right. Yeah. I, I have not seen that yet, but that is, that is a brilliant idea. That's a great idea. Those, those, yeah. the, all those alarms are basically just triggers to get up and, and wander. Yeah. Um, um, so, so Mindy, can you, can you walk us through, um, 
you know, maybe, maybe it's not somebody that has a visual impairment. Maybe it's not somebody that has some type of new medication or a medication that affects them in, in such a way that it's going to make increase their likelihood of fall. Maybe not people with, with gator mobility issues. I feel like a lot of people that fall in nursing homes, it's because of a transition um, between a sitting position and a standing position or, or more, more often I feel like is getting in and out of bed. Um, can you talk about, um, some of the ways that we can prevent falls um, in and around the bed, whether getting in or out of the bed or, you know, while in the bed falling out of it? Generally, it comes down to the old problem of answering the nurse call light. Mm. And that comes down to staffing ratios. Um, And I won't go into all of the law and legislation that does not exist about staffing ratios, right? Except, except to say if we had more staff to respond, it would be a whole lot safer. Yeah, amen. As far as the structure of the bed, which gets the most attention, I think you're barking up the wrong tree. You know, we have nursing homes in some states that put all the mattresses six inches off the floor and um, all sorts of things. We have mattresses that have come up on the sides and then you're trying to get up over this lump all the time. I think the physical structural changes to the room really most of the time cause more issues than not because it feels uncomfortable and you're not used to it. The best prevention for people not able to get in and out of bed safely is strength, strengthening and balance training. Referral to the physical therapist and or the occupational therapist to work on the lower extremity strength to lift yourself and the balance once you do so that you don't go down. A lot of people, if you watch them as we age, ever seen your an older family member take three or four times to get off the couch falling back each time? It's very common. Yeah. Those those are falls. They yeah. don't go to the floor, but they are falls. Good and point. it should be a trigger to us, uh-oh, mm-hmm. I can no longer stand up. I need to work on both my lower extremity strength and my balance reactions. And there's all sorts of evidence-based fall prevention programs with and without a PT to, mm-hmm. to deal with that. In the nursing home, it should start with a PT or an OT. Mm-hmm. So establishing the, you know, getting rid of the the person's body, the intrinsic factors is the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is the environment. We have transfer poles. We can't use, you know, bed rails anymore because they're dangerous. But we can put up a transfer pole between the ceiling and the floor, you know, eight, nine inches away from the side of the bed. So that if a person goes to stand up and there's a big, strong bar there, they're going to grab it and they're going to hold on to it. And they provide a lot of support while people get their blood pressure back up, while they adjust their vision, while they hit a light, while they put on their glasses before trying to move. So that's a very simple abatement. The other thing is to prevent the injury if they do fall. Yeah. And we have all sorts of flooring, like smart cell flooring, that decrease fracture rate, you know, five, six times. And how does it do that? What, what, what type of flooring is this? A smart cell flooring was developed in Canada, used in the UK as well. And it replaces or goes under um, flooring or on top of. And it has these little cells underneath that you don't see that if you hit it with a hard object, like your hip, it moves, it deflates, it allows for a change in the pressure that doesn't happen just by walking, but it, by a high impact. Interesting. And when that happens, the pressure doesn't go into the bone, it goes into the floor. Ah, I got you. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So if you go down, you may scrape yourself up, but you're probably not going to fracture. Got you. Smart cell flooring is not a big expense. And then, you know, a 
person with high risk of getting up unaccompanied or falling, it would be a very logical change for a nursing home to make. Mm-hmm. So there are a lot of things. I just really feel that it's important to make sure nursing homes and families and caregivers know that putting the mattress on the floor and putting a funny scoop mattress and doing all of these things to the bed is missing the point. I got you. So what are what are some things that, that families can do then that they should do if they've got a loved one who's who's a fall risk? And I and I, I would assume that everybody is should be treated as a fall risk. Is that your yes. perspective? Yeah. Especially at night. Yeah. Well, the, the first, my parents are in their 90s, and thank goodness they're still independent, but they're talking about making the move into an ALF. And the first thing that I went from place to place and looked at the fall rates for the facilities. Oh, wow. So they couldn't apply to those yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that had a high fall rate. Right. Then I looked at staff staffing ratios yeah. and made sure that at night there were still enough people to answer call lights. Right. And yeah. looked at their staffing ratios and their call-in rates and what they are, what the people on site in attendance actually were, not how many people were hired. Yeah. So I, um, the other thing to look for to protect is call light response time. Mm-hmm. And that could be as simple as eavesdropping. You know, we have Alexa now. We have all sorts of ways we can snoop. Yeah. And knowing how much time elapses between the call light going off and the response coming in is important information. Now, Medicare, when they go out and do their annual walkthrough, will tell you what those response times are. But, of course, when you know Medicare is in the building, those response times are a whole lot better. Right, right. (laughs) Suddenly you have enough staff. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You know, it just doesn't give you much usable information. So those are the sorts of things that I look at first. And then, of course, the environment. Is there a bathroom in the room? And is Mm -hmm. it readily accessible? And is it safe? Where are the grab bars? Mm -hmm. Are they movable? Are they adjustable? Do they fit my uh, family member? And what is their fall prevention policy? Right. You know what? Are, what are they doing? Right. Um, so, uh, we, we, that's a a lot of really great points on preventing falls and reducing the if there was a fall, reducing the injury um, in the in the bed. What about where we see a lot of falls, and that is in in wheelchairs? Um, can you speak yeah. to preventing wheelchair falls? Um, in- well, there's two types of wheelchairs. There's the transport chair that's in there just for someone else to take you places. And there's the wheelchair that's fit to you because you're a permanent wheelchair user. So in most nursing homes, the most common item is the transport chair. Someone is moving you from point A to point B, Mm -hmm. and you are passive in the process. It still has to fit you. It should not be huge. It should not be tiny. You should be able to... It should fit you so that yeah. when it pulls up behind you, the bottom of the seat is about at the back of your knee, you know, like any other chair that you would want to sit on comfortably. Hmm. Uh, everything should be working, especially the safety equipment. Yeah. The brakes have got to work in order to be used, and yeah. then they have to be used. Yeah. The foot pedals must be removable, and they have to be moved out of the way when you're getting in and out and put down in place when you're in it so that you don't catch your foot. Simple, simple things. The other most important event is use of a gate belt. All patients should have their own gate belt right by the bed in, in sight all the time. If you have a CNA carrying one gate belt from place to place, of course, it becomes an infection control issue. And if they leave it on someone, they're not going to have it. And and in general, can you explain what a gate belt is and what it's used for? 
Oh, sure. A gate belt is a strong web belt that is attached with a double metal clamp so that it cannot come free. And it's attached snug but not painfully tight around the waist of the patient. And it's held by the caregiver with the fingers pointing up to the ceiling to help steady the patient without grabbing an arm or reaching for clothing. Okay. Yeah, and that would make sense that if if they're using the same one on everybody, there's a very good chance that they're um, they're they're carrying germs from uh, or bugs from one person to the next. So every right. resident, what you're saying, needs to have their own gate belt. And I do not see that happen. I can tell you right now, at least here in Georgia, I don't see that happen very often. Um, yeah, and so. Um, in the in the in the last few minutes here, Mindy, um, can mm-hmm. you kind of speak to just other just common strategies for the prevention of falls? I was reading an, a really excellent article on this subject that was talking about um, making sure that the residents had proper fitting footwear as is a is a main mm-hmm. culprit oh, yeah. in, in in fall. So kind of speak to that. Speak to what you've seen um, in terms of of strategies that preventing preventing falls. Yes, the the socks with the little grippers are a little start, but they certainly aren't enough. We need footwear. Everyone needs to know that if you're diabetic, Medicare will pay for footwear once a year. Mm -hmm. Anyone else doesn't matter, but diabetics can at least use that benefit. Shoes should go on and off easily, should secure well. So Mm -hmm. if they tie, they need to have... um, coil elastic so it's easy to put on and off, or Velcro Mm -hmm. needs to have enough room for the toes, obviously needs a good sole for grip, and it needs to stay on the foot and fit. Basic things that we all learned as kids. You can't have flip-flops on, you can't have things that with no back, you can't have nice fluffy things that look cute, but you're Mm going to step on each of the feet side to side, you know, you need to have pretty much a supportive slipper that's like a supportive shoe. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, it makes me think I had a, a friend that was uh, uh, helping somebody move the other day and they had flip flops on and I was like, do you, do you not know what you're doing? Like that's, yeah. that's a sure, sure way to. That's asking for yeah. problems. Mm-hmm. Mindy, can you Absolutely. you had mentioned earlier hip protectors? Can you can you tell us what a hip yeah. protector is? Sure. Um, hip protectors look like a girdle that's looser fitting that has slots in the sides, and you can put pads in that are created to protect the hip trochanter, the part of the hip that sticks out on the side of your thigh. Mm-hmm and or your sacrum, the part of your low back um, between your buttocks. There's very mixed research on fall prote- on um, wearing hip protectors that are clothing. Hmm. The first thing is it changes how all your clothes fit so you can be sure that women aren't going to wear them. Hmm. Um, the other thing is it can make going to the bathroom much more difficult to manage putting them up and down Mm -hmm. and then therefore it can create more incontinence. It is better when possible to put external environmental changes like flooring for hip protection. However, I will, that all said, I will say that in small Caucasian and Asian women with osteoporosis and a very high risk of fracture, that hip protectors have been shown to decrease fracture rates up to 30%. Oh, wow. So that, that's significant. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do, do, what, uh, it's, are you quoting from a particular study? Um, I am, but I would have to look it up to tell you which one it was. Oh yeah, it's okay. I, I was just saying that's interesting that those those subgroups of people that that were studied that showed the benefits. It's interesting. Um, well, they they tend to be small stature, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they also tend to be osteoporotic. I gotcha. see. Um, Mindy, um, 
this this episode has flown by. Um, do you, thank you so so much for coming on and sharing your your expertise and your knowledge. We we learn something new every every episode, and you have brought a lot of great information for our audience. Well, thank you very much. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to try to get information out to the Dr. Renfro. That that she's she's clearly somebody that knows what she's talking about. Yeah, very. Uh, and it's interesting the 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 eyeglasses thing because I just. I don't think that that's a huge priority in nursing homes. People lose their eyeglasses. Um, they're, they're put away and, and that can really contribute to your, your ability to see well, which directly relates to your inclination to fall. Yeah. So it's interesting. And that is a true story about me not being able to see things up close. Like hmm. it's starting to get really bad. I've had glasses since I was in second grade. Yeah. For a long time. I'll never forget the day that, that I was, I, th- I mean, I might have been seven, and they put the glasses on, mm-hmm. and I remember, like, because, I mean, obviously, you don't know, like, what you don't know, yeah. you know what I mean? So, like, I put the glasses on, I'm like, y'all, this is how y'all see? Like, this is how, like, it, I, I, I couldn't believe it. Like, I mean, oh, yeah. like, this is insane how, because, I mean, you got to understand my vision was so bad. Like, I wasn't blind or anything like that, but, like, you know, I couldn't see faces and things like that. And then when you put those glasses on, it was like, man, like, I was at a really, I was literally thinking to myself, I've been at a huge disadvantage. Oh, wow. Yeah. This whole time. Yeah. I was seven. But anyway, um, what else? Again, um, le- just n- last weekend... Last Sunday was Fall Prevention Awareness Day. Yeah. Um, so this is going to conclude our series of episodes about fall prevention. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know what the calendar holds for next the next episode. I can't quite remember what we're going to cover. Anyway, um, who knows? I guess that means you'll have to tune in, audience members. Yeah. So is anyway, it, is it not in cap? Um, no, that was that was last. That was yes. That it will be in caps. See, now Will is thinking fourth dimensionally. Yeah. <laughs> I was not thinking fourth dimensionally. Next episode will be an episode yeah, featuring in October. In October, October fourteenth will be the next episode <laughs> about in caps. Anyway, and if you want to know more about in caps are in, in fact what in caps are, you have to tune in. Yeah. Um, but that's gonna conclude this episode of the Nursing Obvious Podcast. New episodes every other week. Um, you can see it on YouTube, on our website, which is nursinghomeabusepodcast.com, mm-hmm. or wherever you get your podcasts. And with that, we'll see you next time. See you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Nursing Home Abuse Podcast. Nothing said on this podcast, either by the host or the guest, should be construed as legal advice, nor is intended to create an attorney-client relationship between the host or their guest and the listener. New episodes are available every Monday on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, or on your favorite podcast app, as well as on YouTube and our website, nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. Again, that's nursinghomeabusepodcast.com. See you next time.